So Simon, thank you very much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we go into leadership, can you tell us a little bit more about your own background? Where did you grow up? Sure. Uh, I, I was born in Zambia, what, what was then Northern Rhodesia many years ago, mm. in a tiny little agricultural town on the border of Zambia and Malawi, where my father was the bank manager. From there, my folks moved down to what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and I grew up effectively in, in Harare, spent my, my school years there. Mm. I didn't go to university initially because I was drafted into the, the military up in in Rhodesia. At that stage, the, the Chimaringa War was still well underway in the, in the late 1970s. I served my time there and then I came to South Africa where I had initially intended to join a, one of the big corporates like Edgar's or SAB Miller, who in those days ran really nice management, in management programs. So they would hire young people, put you through various departments of the business, give you management skills, and you became a trainee manager. And that was what the path I was going to follow. But in, uh, in, in doing my various interviews, I was working out of a friend's office who had just joined a little South African startup that was kind of ahead of its time. It was, it was inventing, or it had invented a method of monitoring vehicle activity using digital technologies. Back in those days, that was all done still with wax-based tachographs that fitted into the, mm. the vehicle. And the entrepreneur who was running it quite liked the way I operated, so he offered me a job. And importantly, back in those days, he offered me 200 rand a month more than I was going to get from either Edgar's or SAB Miller. So I joined this company called Vanguard Computers, and that's how I started my career in the IT industry with them for a number of years it was eventually that company was bought by by cargo carriers right. I then went from there through to a local software company also a startup called distributed data systems where I was responsible for helping build out a distribution system software based distribution system specking it because of my experience in the previous transport uh, environment and then you know helping get it into the south african market and gradually over the years i joined a couple more software companies or, or it companies because software wasn't a big thing back in those days and then uh, wound up at sap 24 years ago and that has just been a fabulous opportunity for me i've, I've held many different roles here i started as a pre-sales person i uh, eventually be, uh, started running the pre-sales team I've been the marketing director here, mm. I've started our channel business, I uh, started our value engineering practice, mm. our business transformation services practice. So I've had the opportunity in one organization to do many different things. And that's, for me, the kind of person I am, I love the mental stimulation of that. Mm. Because so you, you've got a different kind of, ch a different set of challenges every couple of years, so there's no, no time to get bored. So Simon, today you are the Chief Technology Advisor at SAP. Yeah. So your job is basically to figure out the future. It's partly that, and if anyone who thinks they can figure out the future, I'd like to meet them. But it's, I think, to take some educated, educated mm. guesses at where the future is, is going to be. And a lot of what I do now is, is about trying to help our customers and our partners understand that the pace of change today is really much much faster than we've ever experienced before mm -hmm. and it's happening on more fronts than we've seen it happen before so a lot of people refer today to the fourth industrial revolution the, the world economic forum i think coined the term the problem with that is that it can lead you into thinking that this is just the fourth wave mm -hmm. of something that we've already experienced. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it is. I, I think we're heading into a major discontinuity here that is unlike the previous three waves of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. so, so what I say to people is, by all means, call it the fourth Industrial Revolution, but understand it's a much bigger jump than came between the first and second and second and third waves of the industrial revolution in terms of how we organize in terms of how people socialize in terms of how we apply technology it's all going to change and uh, it's it's exciting it's also pretty scary for me especially here in africa where we look 
down the barrel of a future that's all about lots of science and technology and engineering and mathematics and social skills. Things like ethics and morality are going to become increasingly important. And yet our education systems aren't necessarily producing the people that we will need to compete on the global stage. Now, Simon, looking back at your earlier days, what was your dream career when you grew up? I'm not sure I ever had a dream career. Um, and I think like a lot of youngsters, I, I had a few ideas. My, my father wanted me to become a chartered accountant because he came from a, an era where you needed a you know, great set of qualifications and you were in that career for life. I mean, by way of illustration, my father worked for one bank for 45 years. He worked for Barclays Bank. Mm. That I didn't have that same sense of, well, this is where I can see my life going. So, I've, And that's one of the reasons I've loved SAP is I've been able to taste a little bit of everything. Sales, management, marketing, consulting, the whole gamut mm. of, uh, of um, choices. And I think that's where uh, the youth today will find themselves. You know, they'll, they'll do all sorts of different jobs. And because of this pace of change in this digital economy so fast, you won't necessarily have the luxury of being able to do something for, for 20 years or 25 years, maybe not even 10, because things are moving so quickly. So did I ever have a dream job? Yeah, I guess when I was probably in my early 20s, I thought that uh, being a marketing director would be pretty cool. I, did, I got to do that uh, here at SAP, and it was it was a fun job. Um, it's become a lot more scientific since when I did it. You know, we didn't have the tools back then to measure the impact we were having in the way we do now. So you couldn't automatically do A/B testing like you can on on an internet channel today. So it was a little bit less uh, rigorous, perhaps, but it was still a lot of fun, and it was still about having an impact. You know, building a brand creating a pipeline of opportunities. So that's probably the, the closest to my dream job. If you ask me today what my dream job would be, I lo I've discovered I love writing. So for me, you know, writing articles is, is, is a great part of what I do. And if I, if I had to go and do something full time other than what I'm doing, it would probably be that. So is there a book in progress? Yeah, there, I've, I, there's, a, there's a saying out there that says, everyone's got a book in them. Mm. And for most people, it should stay there. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure. No, there's not a book in progress. Yeah. Uh, I live with a woman who writes, my wife. She's written four books. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen how much discipline you have to have to get that done. And I'm not sure that I have that kind of sit down and get a book done um, in me at the moment. And Simon, in your early days, who inspired you? So I've had, a, I've had a couple of leaders who've inspired me along the way. Um, what, one that really stands out for me was when I was in the army, um, a major, and I was a young uh, lieutenant. And he just, he was one of those, what I learned from him was to lead by example. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, don't ask people ever to do anything you wouldn't do yourself. Mm -hmm. And actually get out there and do it and, sh and model for people what you're looking for so that they've got this, this role model that they can look at mm -hmm. and say, yeah, that, I, I see how that's done and I see why it's done and I understand how to do it. So that, I learned that from him. Um, I've had a couple of leaders in business who have, uh, have mentored me. I think probably the, the thing that stands out for me there was, was um, or has been leaders who give you the space to go out there and do it your way. That mm. The worst thing for me personally is to work under a micromanager. I, I want to be told this is the outcome I'm looking for from my leader and here's a couple of suggestions but go and make it happen and if you have a problem come back to me and when you do go back to them they're not um, what's the word I'm looking for here they're not telling you how to fix the problem but really they're drawing on the experience mm -hmm. to ask you the kind of questions that you might not have asked yourself so have you thought about this what would happen if you did it that way mm -hmm. you know, kind of that coaching model that. Um, That, is, that allows you to discover your own solutions mm. has always worked for me and I tried to do that myself. And Simon, looking back over your career, would you say there was a major turning point? I would say for me the turning point was joining SAP mm. at a time when 
you had this coming together of a business movement in the form of business process re-engineering when Hammer and Champy and Davenport and all those gurus mm. were writing their books and, and proselytizing about business process re-engineering. Coming together at that time with SAP's launch of, of the R3 platform, which was an ERP system that enabled pro the processes that all the gurus were talking about. And you know, it was one of those moments in time, one of those inflection points that Andy Grove from, from Intel talks about. Just a perfect storm. And uh, that's, at that stage, I joined SAP. In South Africa, we were, we were 32 people. We had, I think, seven customers. And today we've got over three and a half thousand customers. We're about 700 people. We have three and a half thousand consultants in the SAP ecosystem. So I've been part of that amazing growth story and it's been fabulous. And really Simon, awesome. what would you say is driving you today? Me personally? Yeah. Um, I, I think still trying to have an impact. You know, I, I, I think one of the things I do The, and a lot of people have commented on this back to me. Is you, the, the, a lot of people say to me, you should go and teach because mm -hmm. you have this ability to take quite complicated topics and make them understandable. Mm -hmm. and in fact, I had that piece of feedback just yesterday from some folks I was doing a presentation for. They said, geez, we've had three or four people come and try and explain mm -hmm. this to us before, but this is the first time we've actually got it. So I try and draw on that. You know, I think one of the thing, other things I've learned in, in life is that it's always better to try and play to your strengths mm. than spend a lot of time and energy trying to make up for your weaknesses. Mm. Put people around you who can compliment you. I'll give you an example. I'm shocking at, admi at admin. I'm not an administrator. So, you know, I don't try and get into a space that requires me to do a lot of admin. And if I do, I try and find someone who can help me get that done. Because I'm much better at being out there, talking to customers, talking to partners, doing this kind of blend of evangelism and teaching that is a big part of my current job. And one of the things I'm trying to do now, in big corporates, it may not be, in fact, it's not as true of small companies. Because when, when this company was still very small in South Africa, everybody knew everybody else in the business. And everybody knew what we were doing in terms of the customers we were working with and the things we were trying to get done. As you get bigger, that becomes more diffuse, obviously, and, and bureaucracy starts to grow. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I try and do today is act like a broker inside the organization, mm -hmm. putting, putting people together who, as they chase their own KPIs mm -hmm. that they are measured on and accountable for, they may not look up and out and around and say, hey, if I just joined up with that person over there, mm -hmm who's got a complementary set of things we, we, he, he or she's focused on, we could do something great together. So I try and do a, a, a lot of that inside the organization, bringing people together, helping them see how they could collab collaborate more, get more done, have greater impact. Right. So Simon, let's talk about the future of leadership. In your view, what does the future of leadership mean to you? So I think a few things. I think From, a, from this digital economy perspective, one thing we are going to see is that decision making is going to become a lot more fact based mm. because we will have so much more data on which to base those mm. decisions. At the same time, a lot of mundane decision making is likely to become a lot more uh, automated because mm. we'll be applying artificial intelligence and machine learning mm. to making those routine decisions in the business. So for all of us, but especially for leaders, the work is going to become much more about looking outwards and trying to understand where the world is going, mm -hmm. using uniquely human abilities to solve complex problems, to come up with new strategies, mm -hmm. using the unique human ability for empathy and mm -hmm. connection to build new relationships, because a lot of this new economy is going to be about networking. You know a little bit of something. I know a little bit of something. Mm. We put that together. We create a new value proposition. Mm. But for that to happen, you and I have to be empathetic about what each other needs. We have to learn how to collaborate. We have to learn to create together. So things like design thinking, I think, will become an important part of the leadership arsenal going forwards. Uh, and I think if, if we get it right as a species, we'll actually use these tools of the digital economy, things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, to allow ourselves to become more human. The challenge, 
we will face is to make sure we bring everybody with us and we don't wind up with um, you know the situation you're starting to see emerge in the world where very few people mm. have captured the majority of the world's wealth mm. and even more so when you look at the the really big uh, tech companies today um, and there's a big divide between the folks who mm. you know own the capital there and own the organization and that wealth and the rest of society then that is a recipe I think ultimately for mm. for some kind of unrest or revolution mm. which probably wouldn't be good for the poor or the rich so I think a lot of leadership is going to be about being a lot more purpose driven and and one of the things I love about being at SAP is we have a lot of conversations in this company about our purpose which is to help the world run better mm. and improve people's lives so we don't just look at a, a sales opportunity as a cold-hearted commercial transaction we look at this and say you know what if we can help that company use technology better they will produce their products with less waste they will produce their products with more engaged people or whatever it might be and it's right. often a combination of these things but it's it's that sense of purpose you know are we doing this because we not just to make money but because we want to help this world run better and mm. certainly that's one of the things that gets me out of bed in the morning and and has kept me with SAP mm. I really believe it's a, a worthwhile thing to aim for and Simon what have you learned from your own journey that you consider most important for building future leaders I think um, And I'm not saying I do this particularly well, but I think one of the important things to do as a leader and a manager is to manage up mm. as much as you manage downwards. I think one of the mistakes I've made in my career, it, when I, certainly when I was a young manager, was I spent a lot of time focusing downwards on my team and making sure they were all doing what they needed to do so I could deliver the results I was accountable for. But I didn't necessarily spend enough time thinking about what my boss My, the leaders above me were trying to accomplish and how I could support them to, to do that. So that would be a piece of advice I would mm. give people. Manager. It's not about being sycophantic mm. uh, to the people above you, but it mm. is about making sure you've got their back mm. as much as you would expect your own people to have your back. Um, that's something I sometimes haven't done particularly well, so that's a lesson I've learned. Uh, and the other lesson I've learned is that it's... It, definitely okay to make mistakes mm. providing you take some time to reflect mm. and I think this is something that is always a good practice if you can carve out even if it's 10 minutes of every day at the end of the day to say so what did I do today what did I do well where I didn't do something well what could I do differently mm. how am I gonna how am I gonna take that into mm. the next day and try and figure out you know how to how to be better at what I what I'm doing whatever that might be And Simon, when you speak to aspiring leaders, what is it you tell them they should focus on for future-proofing their career? You have to be... I think there's two things that are really important in today's world. One is you have to be humble. Mm. I think the minute you think you know everything, you're done. Because there's just too much to know. You can never know everything. And when you think you do, you stop learning. And when you stop learning, you very quickly fall into irrelevance so that's the first thing and the second thing is to be humble and I think the two are, are, are inextricable you if, if you if you're not humble you won't you you will think you know everything so they, they kind of go very close together but having that humility to to know that you don't have all the answers mm. it's okay to go and ask somebody for help mm. it's okay to go and ask somebody for information I think those are two really important leadership qualities And I think we've seen them reflected in great leaders around the world. You know, people, whether it was, you know, Churchill in World War II, whether, who, who was humble enough and vulnerable enough quite often to, like, weep about the situations he was encountering mm. in the world, whether it's Mandela, whether it's Gandhi, but you can look at the great icons or the smaller ones, and you'll often find that they have this core of, mm. of curiosity uh, and humility. Mm. That doesn't mean you have to be servile. You know, you can mm. still be assertive and stand up for what you believe in. Mm. Um, and, and you have to have confidence that what you're doing is the right thing. But for me, the, the humility and the cu curiosity are important. And Simon, talking about technology, what are the key technologies 
that you would envisage um, will empower the future of leadership? I think without a shadow of a doubt, it's going to be, it's going to be all rest on data. And mm -hmm. if you think about what's happening in the world today, we are, through material science, uh, we're able to create new materials, which means we can create new sensors, we can create new batteries. We can start to put sensors into places we could never reach before mm -hmm. and generate data. So from a, from a global point of view, our ability to wire up this planet in many different sensors and create data about what's happening mm -hmm. in the world around us is the foundation for everything. Once we have that data, and there's going to be so much of it that we will be incapable as humans of processing it. We will need the technologies of big data and machine learning and, and artificial intelligence in all its various guises to help us find the patterns and the meaningful events mm -hmm. in that data. We will, I think, be able to, as I said earlier, put a lot of the routine decision making into the machine the machine being the organization, and then take the people who currently are buried in the machine doing mm. mundane routine work out of the machine and have them working on the machine to make a better machine. So you unleash that human talent. Simple example. Today in most organizations you've got lots of people sitting in the debtors department matching the line items on the bank statement, the payments, mm. to the line items on the invoices. That's kind of boring work, that's not engaging, mm. it's not using the full power of the human ingenuity. Mm. So we could get a machine algorithm to do that and we could take those people and have them think about, you know, maybe we send them out and we help them work with our customers to figure out how they should manage their cash flow better so they can pay us on time. Mm. That kind of thing is going to start coming quite quickly. And Simon, when it comes to social media, what is it that you tell aspiring leaders they should watch out for and how should they handle their presence on social media? <laughs> okay, I'm a baby boomer as you can see from the color of my hair. Um, I'm on social media but I wouldn't say I'm a social media maven in any sense of the word. I do think it's important that you have a presence. I think uh, you've got to be, a basic rule of thumb that I heard a lawyer once say is if you don't want to see it on the back page of the Sunday Times, don't put it out there. Because once it's out there, it's mm. irretrievable and it lives forever. And we've seen some pretty nasty exam mm. examples in our own South African society of that uh, recently. What, what I think is, is um, interesting is the, a lot of the research that's starting to come to the fore now around the negative impacts of social media. You know, mm. especially youngsters who are judging themselves against the sort of mm. perfect life they think other people are having because people only post the good bits and then you're sitting there and you haven't got those good bits in your life you start to feel like you're a failure and it's really interesting I saw a longitudinal study in the States that shows how the suicide rate of young particularly young women mm. has spiked since 2007 when the iPhone came out and people started getting more and more connected mm. on on social media so I think it's it can be a valuable tool, but it's got to be properly harnessed. And I don't think we're properly harnessing it right now. And I always say to people, you know, when you're on social media, if it doesn't cost you anything, it means you're the product. Exactly. So all of that data about you is mm. being monetized by somebody mm. for their own ends. Mm. And you need to think about what that means. The other danger is that we start to live in these filter bubbles. So because, uh, you know, because these social networks can get a very deep understanding of who I am through what I, who I like and who I follow and, and what I'm saying, you know, using text analytics, they can start to narrow my world down instead of broadening it out because then they only feed me the stuff that I appear to be interested in. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stifles the curiosity I was mm -hmm. talking about earlier on. So I think it's a, a, a two-edged sword and I don't think, I, I think it's too early yet for us as a species to have figured out how mm. to, to use social media properly. If you think how long evolutionary progress takes, mm. this is a little tiny, 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 mm. tiny blip on our progress mm. from you know being a protozoa to, to the apex primate mm. on the planet. So you know it's going to take some time to figure it out. And Simon, as a mentor to future leaders, can you maybe share a success story or two where you mentored somebody and that person took your advice to heart? Um, 
Yeah, I've, I've got a couple. I mean, there's one, there's one uh, young person I employed many, many, about a decade ago, who I brought into SAP against the better judgment of some of my peers at the time because this person hadn't ever worked in the software industry and I was bringing them in to be a pre-sales person in the software space. Today that person is a really senior CIO in a really large, very progressive company. And I always look at that and think I had a little part to play in that person coming from the world they were in into the world they now inhabit. So, you know, that, that fills me with a sense of, uh, of kind of grat- gratitude that I had the ability to, to do that in someone's life. And then, uh, yeah, on a kind of monthly basis, I try and touch a few people's lives and help them get stuff, get stuff done. I mean, one of the things I'm doing at SAP is I've been uh, kind of the patron of our Toastmasters Club. We founded a Toastmasters Club here about 16 months ago. And it's fabulous to see people who come into that little environment inarticulate, stuttering, you know, really struggling with how to put a coherent sentence together. And within a few months, in that safe space, they be, they blossom, mm-hmm. you know, and they start really coming into their own and, and understanding their real power and how they can communicate that to people. I, I love that kind of stuff. It really makes me feel life is worthwhile. And Simon, are there any role models of leadership that you would suggest future leaders should study and maybe learn from? You know, if I look in, in, our, in our local society, I, I think the obvious icon that everyone is, is kind of the go-to guy is, is Madiba. But you look at people like uh, Tuli Maroncella and mm. the, the, the integrity with which she held her position and, and when she was in the public protector's office. I think we need to look to people like that. Uh, who've got obvious integrity, who stand up for what they believe in, who have the lo- the needs of the larger society uh, at heart, and who are trying to get something good done. I think it's really important because right now in South Africa, we've got an awful lot of rabble rousers who are out there mm. driving wedges into our society mm. rather than trying to build the new South Africa. And, and, you know, I can understand where they're coming from because we haven't fixed a lot of the problems in the last 20 years. But it's not going to be productive in the long run, that kind of mm. rabble-rousing, because it, it just creates polarization and alienation between groups rather than bringing us all together. So, yeah, this, uh, we need the, those kind of role models. Now, Simon, how can our listeners connect with you and where should they follow you? So I am on Twitter. Although, like I said earlier on, I'm not the most active Twitter. Uh, at uh, m- my handle is uh, Simon J at Simon J S A P, and then I'm also on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn as Simon Carpenter. And last but not least, Simon, is there one piece of advice that you would really like to convey to future leaders that they should implement in their own life? I think I go back to what I said earlier on: stay humble, mm-hmm. stay curious. Talk to people. Mm. Well, Simon, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom and reminding us that we should all stay humble, curious and talk to people and listen to what they have Mm. to say. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.